And welcome to Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. I am Chris Graham, and we're going to talk today with the 6th District Democratic Congressional nominee, Jennifer Lewis. And uh, Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, uh, you know, this is this is not a first time for you running for Congress uh, and uh, running for, for a political office in general. Um, and uh, the district, I guess, let's start here. I was going to, let's start with just the district in general is a little changed. And we know yeah. from the 2020 census, uh, not, not a lot of change, but I mean, uh, I guess you're having to learn a little bit of some, maybe some new areas to, mm-hmm. to visit, right? Yeah. So um, we'll, we've added some in the Northern um, part of the district. So we're pretty much the I-81 corridor from Winchester down to Roanoke. We lost Lynchburg, uh, which when I ran in 2018, I loved uh, canvassing and campaigning in Lynchburg. Lynchburg is a great city with great Democrats. Um, But it never made sense to me that I had to go on 29 and kind of, it just didn't make sense um, just like geography wise and just like, so it just kind of made sense that I would lose Lynchburg and kind of add more of the 81 corridor. Uh, But I'm, I'm sad to lose Lynchburg. Like I said, it was it was great to campaign down there. I really enjoyed um, being the only Democrat and the only woman that showed up at the Liberty University uh, debate. So that was exciting. So there's definitely some things that happened in Lynchburg that aren't ever going to happen anywhere else. Um, so I'm sad to lose that. But I'm excited to add the new areas of the district. Um, I've had one meeting with the Clark County Dems, um, and we've got a kickoff event coming up later in June. So excited to meet new people. You learn how how big this valley is when you have to drive up and down as much as you have and will uh, this this year, right? You know, the good thing about being in Waynesboro is we're literally in the middle. So it's an hour and a half one way or an hour and a half the other way. So um, to be a congressional candidate, I really think it's smart to live right smack dab in the middle. So uh, maybe uh, whoever... uh, other wants to run for this district should live in Waynesboro. Yeah, re- live in Waynesboro, relocate if you have to. Um, and in, in addition to the fact you get to live in Waynesboro, that's not that's, that's exactly a, a bonus to the whole, the whole affair. Um, you know, I have to ask what you, you know, you ran in 2018, you ran yeah. for the House August 2019. What makes you want to what makes you want to run? Um, it, it's a tough district for Democrats. Um, but I mean, gosh, it's we can't we can't we can't uh, just to see territory. Right. Uh, I'm sure that might be a part of it. So one thing uh, on my election night in 2018, um, Senator Cray Deeds came to our, our party. And before he even came to me, he, he went over to my mom. He went over to my mom and he said, make sure she runs more than just once. So this was my, my uh, Congress race. 2018 It was my first time running. Um, and he told my mom, uh, I ran five times before I, lo- I won. So Cray Deeds, the, the great Senator Cray Deeds, um, a great Democrat, um, he ran five times before he won. So, um, you know, it's name recognition. It's getting people, you know, just keep on trying. Um, and you just kind of knock that percentage down each time. So, um, you know, when I ran in 2018, I was dedicated to run again, um, took 2020 off, um, but just wanted to, to jump back in this year. And you know, the, at this stage, you know what it's all about. I mean, you know the the, the time demands, the travel demands, yep. the mm-hmm. all the meetings and the and, and and getting to know people and that kind of thing. And and, and folks know you, and I, I, yeah. I would bet that's an important part of this as well. For sure, um, and I, that's my favorite part is getting to know people, um, talking with people. It's so funny. I had a a volunteer come with me down to Roanoke last weekend, and she's like, "Oh, you must get so tired of talking." I was like, "No." I very rarely talk at events other than giving, getting up and giving my speech. But most of the time I'm listening it to be a candidate. It's really not about talking. It's about listening. Um, I definitely listen 75% of the time I'm talking maybe 25% of the time. So, um, and I think my being a mental health worker, you know, helps me in that I'm such an active listener as it is with my clients that being a candidate just kind of fits that role really well for me. What do you do in mental health? Um, talk about that a little bit and, um, and, and what made you want to get into that field? Um, so my, my title is hospital liaison. What I do is I do discharge planning for folks coming out of our state psychiatric hospitals. I've been at the job for 10 years now, um, and it's changed a lot in 10 years. Um, you know, 10 years ago, we had much um, a bigger pot of flexible spending. Um, 
And I know to most people, you might not think that um, silverware, uh, more than one pair of underwear is mental health, but it is. Um, you know, when I'm working with folks coming out of a place like Western State Hospital, which is a state of the art psychiatric hospital, um, oftentimes people literally have just what they're wearing on their body. They have nothing else. Um, so 10 years ago, we used to have this kind of pot of money that we would be able to access to. We'd have to submit a request. Um, you know, I need this amount of money for underwear, uh, you know, um, a couch, a bed, whatever it is. And that funding has really dried up over the last 10 years. So, um, you know, I'm putting people in apartments with a bed, but that's it. No couch, no TV, no phone, no silverware, no dishes. It's literally a place to sleep. And although that's great, and I'm, I'm very grateful to, that they have a roof over their head and a bed to sleep in, they don't have anything else. And when they are, they're sitting at home, uh, they're lonely, they have nothing to entertain themselves with, that's when they start getting into trouble as well. So, um, you know, again, people might not think that these things, um, these items um, are essential to recovery and to stability, but it is. Um, having a place that you can feel comfortable at home and know that you've got food and know that you've got a microwave to warm it up in, that keeps you stable, that keeps you in recovery. Um, so yeah, my clients, their stories is exactly why I'm running for office because I see all of the cracks. I mean, it's, it, it's like we don't even have a net at all. <laughs> um, and it's so frustrating to work with these people who, I mean, my clients have taught me so much about life and about myself and are so amazing in so many ways. And to know, to absolutely know we can do better and we have the money to do better. We have the resources to do better. We have the people and the passion to do better. We literally just lack the political will. And that frustrates me more than anything else. Like I could deal with someone saying as a government, we don't have the money to take care of everybody. Okay, let's figure something else out, but we do. And that's to allow somebody. And, and I've had people tell me more than one pair of underwear is a luxury item. No, it's not. How can you wash your underwear if you only have one pair? You mean you're, you you got to be naked while you do your laundry at the laundromat? I mean, it's these kind of things that, you know, people just don't think about unless you experience it yourself. You have a family member that experiences it yourself or you work in this job. Um, and it's just so frustrating to, to see so many people suffer, suffer when it doesn't need to be that way. We have plenty of money to throw at, for example, Virginia is considering apparently throwing money at a brand new NFL football stadium somewhere in Northern Virginia. We've got lots of money to throw at, at big business that uh, is, is looking for incentives to locate here. And I understand the arguments about uh, how, how those dollars might create jobs. Uh, also understand that businesses are going to go where they can do business the best and, and that they don't necessarily need our help to get there. And yet we don't have money for health care or mental health. And, and yet right. we also talk about mental health every time there's a mass shooting. And we've had three now in the last just week and a half, two weeks. Um, you'll hear Republicans say uh, it's not a gun problem. It's a mental health problem. And yet they, they don't want to fund mental health. They don't right. want to. And, and certainly they don't want to fund health care either. Right. And, and like I said, I've been in, in my current job for 10 years, but in the mental health field for 20. I've never had a client who is a mass shooter. You know, my clients are schizophrenic, they're diagnosed with bipolar, they're diagnosed with all these, you know, serious mental illness. They're more apt to hurt themselves than hurt somebody else. And that's what bothers me the most. And I get really emotional about it is because after these shootings, I have to go to work and talk to my clients about why they're blamed for these things. And they don't understand. They're like, I've never done anything like this. I, I would never, you know, and it's just, and I guess it's, you know, it just makes it that much more frustrating when people do blame mental health and then don't fund mental health. You know, I would, I would totally roll over every, any day of the week and say, fine, let's blame it on mental health every day of the week. If that means you're going to fund it, you know, yeah. but that's, yeah. the th you know, but that's just not true. Um, you know, the, the, the reason that we have mass shootings in this country is we have a toxic gun culture in this country that doesn't exist anywhere else. Every other country deals with domestic violence. Every other country deals with mental illness. 
every other country deals with suicides. You know, half of the gun deaths in this country are suicides. So while, yes, the mass shootings, they kill a lot of people all at once. But why on earth are half of our, ma- our, of our gun deaths suicides? Why are we so suicidal in this country? Um, that's, I mean, we really have got to peel back the layers of this country and get to the bottom of, you know, why we are such a sick country in so many ways. Um, and again, it goes back to we can do better. And I think, you know, if we all were taking care of each other, we wouldn't be su- such a sick country because when you start giving of yourself and you care about other people outside of yourself, it literally makes a better community, a better society. I'm with you on the let's blame mental health for everything. Every time there's something bad going on, I, I've only in, in the last year uh, started um, uh, addressing mental health issues with myself. Anxiety mm-hmm. was crippling yep. for me. I didn't realize it. I functioned all my life. Uh, and uh, then a health scare threw me into a loop and made me address the issues head on. And, and now I feel I'm mean, after nine months of therapy. Uh, I feel like I'm a, a you know, a, a much more relaxed, a more efficient person. And also though, I, I definitely can understand it's, I think, I think we, we underestimate dramatically how many people suffer from issues with mental health. I think it's, it would be just like saying, well, only half of us have medical health problems. Right. We all know we have medical health problems. We have to right. go to the doctor. I think you had to go to the doctor today for something. Yeah. Drug, right? And yeah. uh, it turns out it wasn't, but I mean, we all have, we all have health, physical health issues. Right. If you are alive, you're going to have health problems. Yeah. And I think if you're alive, you're going to have a mental health something. I mean, it may not be, you know, it may not be the level of cancer uh, as the equivalent in medical health, but we all have issues. And so to just let's just blame mental health for why this guy goes up and goes and shoots up a a supermarket and why this kid shoots up a school and this guy goes and shoots. I mean, mean, why aren't we figuring out maybe all of these shooters are uh, diabetic? You know, what if it's, you know, it's just like, it's that silly. It's that absolutely ridiculous that you can say it's mental health when, you know, like you said, the majority of us have mental health issues, but the majority of us aren't committing these mass shootings. Right. Right. Um, You know, a lot of people were bullied in school, including myself. I never shooted, shot up any school because I was bullied. Um, You know, when I was a senior in high school, when Columbine happened and, you know, to think that here we are 20 years later, dealing with 19 uh, elementary kids gunned down at school. I mean, it's just, it's, this is America. It's not the America I would have thought 20 years ago when Columbine happened. I would never have guessed that in 20 years down the road, we're still dealing with the same thing. And still, and still putting out thoughts and prayers and uh, Mm -hmm. blaming mental health and then not funding it and, and still debating background checks which okay i understand that's one that would be one item in the arsenal so to speak to help uh to 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 start towards gun control but background checks wouldn't have solved any of the last three mass shootings right um we we we, but we can't even are we can't even debate that because republicans will say well that's going too far no but you look at our I've, i've written about this extensively the last few weeks um australia is a great example. Yes. He's a great example. Israel is, Israel's a war zone and you have to be 27 years old. You've got to have a doctor's note. Yeah. You've, and, and even if you get the government license, you don't, it's not automatic. If you're 27 with a doctor's note, um, you can still only own one gun and 50 rounds of ammunition. Right. They're in a war zone. Right. Well, maybe of their own creation, but they're in a war zone. Australia banned uh, 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 assault uh, rifles, 1996. So did yep. the UK. After and one mass shooting what, in one Australia, mass shooting. After 50 their, people dead. Yeah. After their version of Columbine. And we yep. have had how many Columbines since 1990? Right. Yep. And we can't even move on background checks. This, that's the, you know, when I, when I talk, I mentioned to you, Jennifer, before we hit record, every time I talk with my wife, Crystal, uh, about these incidents that pop up, you know, her, her first thing is, are we ever going to get anything done? Can we ever change this? And there's so many people, at, you know, throw their arms up in the air and say, we can't change this. Yes, we can if we have the will. And the will might be starting to develop now. You know what? I think, you know, a lot of people keep saying, you know, nothing ever happened after Columbine, Sandy Hook, after the shooting, that shooting. What I think sticks up to me the most is that nothing changed after that gunman shot up the, the baseball game that the senators were playing against each other. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 
Because I always thought, well, once it happens to them, then they'll change their mind. But even when it happened to them, they still didn't change their mind. Like, can you imagine being out there playing? Ba- and I know you love baseball. Oh, yeah, yeah. Out there playing baseball and a gunman shows up and you've got to run for your life and you're scared to death and all the emotions that go through your mind. And you're in the and middle then of you a big spill. field with nowhere to hide either. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And then at the still at the end of the day, you still vote against gun reform after you just had to run for your life. How does I I literally don't know how that makes sense in anybody's brain. And part of me thinks that these these people who are voting against gun reform, they're like they have just deluded themselves and brainwashed themselves so much. Um, You know, it's kind of similar to like the stop the steal stuff. I think these folks tell themselves this stuff so many times that they just start to believe it even though they know it's not true. It's just their talking point and it's just been programmed in their head to just, yep, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. I'll tell you something that frustrates me is that this has been going on for 50 years. The NRA funded the rewriting of our constitution in the 1970s. Um, the, the second amendment was interpreted very differently until, I mean, even Richard Nixon in his, his uh, uh, Watergate tapes that came out eventually was talking about uh, banning handguns. Uh, in the early 1970s, and, and the NRA turned things around. Um, and it, I just saw a poll, an economist YouGov poll uh, today, came out today at least. Um, and, and even half of Democrats, according to this poll, at least in this survey, say that we should arm teachers. I mean, even half of even half of people who have common sense think that that's the solution. And that what that tells me is 50 years of repeated messaging has beaten us down. And it really, if anything, you know, this, this last shooting showed us the good guys with guns don't save the day. They literally stand in the way of saving the day. So to think, you know, and I, I did, um, before my current job, I did therapeutic day treatment in our schools. So I've worked in elementary, middle and high schools, all in this area. I cannot imagine arming teachers when they're already dealing with you know, 20 kids on their own, all of the things that are going on, you add any kind of special needs children into that, you've got to, you know, and then you have a mass shooting incident. So you're trying to get the kids to be quiet, settle down, remember the lockdown drill, let me get my gun out, load it, because are we, are are the teachers going to have their guns loaded all day long, just waiting for a mass shooting? Or is the gun on them and the ammunition is locked up somewhere else? I mean, really, how is this even going to work? Yeah. So if the cops who are essentially trained and I assume they go on, you know, go to the gun range every now and again to keep up with their gun gunmanship, um, you know, they can't even shoot someone with accuracy and they're trained. You want to just give a handgun to a teacher and say, shoot. A, and, and that's another thing. You're making the teacher then become a merc. Like, even though someone is, is harming you, to make that decision to harm someone and take a life, even though that person might be taking your life. I mean, that's a huge responsibility to put on somebody that didn't ask for that, you know? And, you know, I've often thought like, what would I do if someone came into my house? Would I be ready to kill someone? I don't know. I don't know. Um, And so I think, you know, we can't just say teachers, you got to carry a gun. Like we have to make sure that they like, and the teachers that I know personally, you know, my husband's parents are both retired teachers. I don't know a single teacher that wants to carry a gun. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, uh, you know, one, we, we're we already having trouble keeping yeah. staff at, at schools as it is, right? We, we, we don't have enough teachers as it is. We're not paying them enough. And now we're saying you also have to get hand arm, uh, uh, firearms training. Right. Uh, and then the, the obvious safety issue of, okay, so if the only way it's effective is if there's a gun in the classroom, well, so we're going to lock it because obviously we have to lock it. It can't be loaded. It's got to be un- it's got to be unloaded and locked. Right. Um, in two so, separate places. You see, yeah, and and you you see you happen to see you look out your window like some of those teachers in Uvalde, Texas did a couple of weeks ago. You look out your window and you see a, a guy walk by with a gun. Is that enough time to, to right. do what you need to right. do? And are you are you are we training teachers to be teachers? Or are we training them to be gun experts or right, right. both for the amount of money we pay them, we're, we're not going to have any teachers. Right. Um, we're not going to have. Well, and, 
in the front page of the news leader yesterday or the day before the principal of Wilson's leaving already. She's been there for a year, one year. She lasted one year, a principal. Think of all the, 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 everything she had to do to, to be in that position and even be it, you know, it takes six months to get into a, a, a position like that. Well, much less the graduate school and everything else you've got to, you know, and then the shooting in Tulsa just yesterday, last night, yeah. I guess it was. Um, so now we're going to arm doctors and nurses as well. Is right. that what we're going to have to do? And then, you know, s- supermarket shoppers, I guess we should all go to the supermarket loaded and strapped and loaded and ready to, to uh, defend the world. People go to Kroger already armed. I mean, I was in Target. I was shopping for shoes in Target one day. It's early morning. Hardly anybody is there. And some guy, but it was a couple and she, he had his camo gun on this hip and she had her pink get camo gun on this hip and she had the baby on the other hip. You have two guns in target at eight o'clock in the morning for what, for what? Yeah. And chances yeah. are you're going to injure an innocent bystander. And then, yeah. you know, like I, I just, I just don't get how more guns is the answer when we more refuse. Guns yeah. We refuse to do anything else. The only thing that we do is thoughts and prayers and throw more guns at it. Yeah. We kind of do the same. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll help us shift here because we could talk about this all day. And I think we really could. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really good. I mean, I think we do the same with we, we just talk about education. We've been talking about health care. It, it's more thoughts and prayers than it is actual effort. We don't we don't fund our schools well enough. We never have. We, we probably yeah. never will. Our part of the state. You know, I, I love folks in Northern Virginia. I've got a lot of friends who live up there, but, you know, their their school systems are funded well. I mean, and, and the way we do things in Virginia, I know you're running for federal office. The feds could probably help out here, but, you know, our, I think our kids are left behind. I hate to use the, the that talking point from 20 years ago, but I feel like right. our kids are left behind. And I feel like a lot of kids in rural areas and inner yeah. cities are left behind. And we, we yeah. our kids can't compete on an equal footing with, with kids from, yeah. better, from, from wealthier school districts. We need a federal response to our crumbling schools all over this country. I mean, we need a federal countrywide program to upgrade all of our schools, rebuild them. I, I toured schools in 2018 that I was embarrassed. Like, I literally was like, wait, what kids, kids come here? There's, I mean, active leaks coming out, out of the ceiling and just crumbling, crumbling. Oh, oh. And when you send your kid to a building that is crumbling apart, leaking, it's telling them, whether you say it or not, it's telling them that you don't care about their education. You don't care about their future. Yeah. So we've got to have, I think, I think we have to have a federal response because it's, it's such a big problem everywhere um, that I don't think the states can do it. Definitely the localities can't. I mean, look how far, you know, how long it took to get the Waynesboro high school, um, you know, and that, again, so many of the localities, again, this is why local races are just as important as the, you know, Congress and president. When you have conservative, and I don't mean that politically, but like fiscally conservative councils that don't want to increase your taxes, um, they want to, you know, get re- reelected. So they keep everything really low. Well, yeah, a low tax rate is good for a while. But after a while, then you start realizing, oh, that low tax rate means we pay for nothing. And we have nothing. Um, so then you spend all this time catching up. Um, and we're so far behind that it is. It's so overwhelming to think, how could we even catch up? Um, but we've got to start. We've got to start. What are, uh, you know, when I look at the 6th District, it's 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 maybe more consistent now because of the fact that, you know, we don't, you don't have to drive over to 29 and come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, our district is more geographically consistent, certainly, and maybe more, um, uh, maybe more common sense consistent too. What are some of the common issues that, that you mean you recognize from 2018 and you've been paying attention to the last four years and you know, are our issues today uh, up and down that 81 corridor? You know, the overall feeling of nobody cares about us, I think is the overwhelming feeling. Um, whether it's, you know, you know, Lately, every conversation I have with voters is about gun control and gun violence. Um, but before the, the last shooting, it was just basic, you know, they just, they against us. And it's not Republican or Democrat. It's the haves versus the have nots. 
and it's the working class who are fighting tooth and nail for a living wage and affordable health care and mental health care and all of this stuff. And then they look at the people at the top and think they make all of the decisions for us. They have all the money. They, they're making profit of profit profit. They don't care about us. Um, and so I feel like that's this kind of hopelessness and almost kind of like what you were saying your wife says about the gun issue is people have just really given up and felt like nothing is ever going to change. This is the way that it is. And we just have to suck it up and live with it. And I really discourage people from feeling that way because in 2018, only 50% of the district showed up to vote. 50% didn't even show up. So you think of the, of that 50%, if they would have voted for us or voted in any different, I mean, they could have, you, all of that 50% could have gotten together and decided who they wanted and, and beat us all. I don't know. You know, it's just, yeah, yeah. it's just, I, I really want to encourage people to look at their candidates and be excited about someone who you might not think has a chance in hell of winning, such as myself, <laughs> and, and get behind that person. Talk to those non-voters in your family and in your friend circles and your coworkers, because the only, the only way we are going to change things is changing our leadership. We can march in the streets every day of the week. We can have protests. We can have vigils. We can have rallies. We can sign petitions. None of that is going to change anything until we have a change in our elected officials. Um, and this is coming from a grassroots organizer. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in protesting and and standing up and, and shouting on the side of the street what you want to say, of course. Um, but all of that action has to then turn into going to the polls and voting. Um, if you have the, the, the guts to stand out on the side of the road with a sign that says, stand up for my trans child, then have the, the guts to go into the voting booth. Um, so, you know, people want to pretend that, you know, I'm not political, I hate politics. Well, guess what? Your landlord is political, your job is political, your boss is political. You know, everything about your life is political, is politics. And if you don't get engaged in it, then you're gonna be taken advantage of and you're not gonna live the best life that you can live. People in the sixth district could literally be living a better life, a healthier life, a cleaner life. And that's what people, if they vote for me, I will give them health care. I will fight for a clean environment. I will fight, of course, for mental health for everybody. And yet we have a congressman currently in office who votes against every piece of legislation that's ever introduced by a Democrat. He's never once put out any talking points or a social media post about his ideas, his solutions. His only argument is Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and the squad suck. I'm better than them. Like that's his only argument. And that's, and that, I think turns a lot of people away. They just give up when they see that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to be someone that knocks on your door and I have a solution to your problem. You talk to me about something that is going on in your life. I've got something for that. Um, and that's what I found going door to door. That's my favorite thing to do when I campaign is going door to door. Um, you know, if you give people a little bit of hope, um, you know, that's, that's really all they need. I have found the same thing. Uh, ben Klein is an affable guy. I, every time I've spoken with him, he's yeah. he's a very pleasant man to talk with. And not everybody that you talk with is. And I'm, you know, some some people who are Democrats are, are not easy to talk totally. to. And, and so I'm yeah. I'm not talking political. He's a nice guy to talk to. Yeah. Bob he's Goodlatte, a good looking well, guy. He's a yeah, and, and and Bob Goodlatte before him, very, you know, very easy to talk to. And he, uh -huh. he answered my questions all the time. I've been covering politics. Longer than I care to admit. 1995, I started covering politics in his area. I don't think I look that old, but I, 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 but I am that old. When you were a junior in high school. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I would say the same thing about Ben Klein that I would say about Bob Goodlatte. Uh, they have represented this district, they, or at least they've been elected and they sit in a chair that represents this district. Mm -hmm. I've never felt that they've represented this district. I, I, you know, neither one. They they both come. Ben is a uh, is an acolyte of of, of Bob Goodlatte. Uh, he worked for him literally right. uh, yeah. when he was coming through, and has the same approach, which is don't make waves. You know, yeah. they don't really introduce legislation. Um, they don't put out fire. You know, press releases about anything right. important. They don't make statements. They don't do. They don't do silly things in Congress. They, you know, they're not the. 
uh, Marjorie Taylor they're, Green. Right. You know, they're not right. that, but they, they don't do anything. Yeah. Um, and, and we, uh, gosh, I, we want, we, there's, as you mentioned, this, this district suffers because they don't do anything. Right. And we've had that and Bob Goodlatte started representing this district in 1992. We're, we're 30 years into having no representation in Congress. Yeah. Yeah. And where, what, what better, how, how much better off are we for 30 years of nothing? And that's, I was on a, I did a radio interview with a conservative radio host last week. And I, I asked him, I said, I would love for Klein supporters to tell me, and I won't argue with you, tell me, what has Ben Klein done to better your life? I just want to know. I won't push back. I won't debate the fact. Just tell me, what has Ben Klein done? What can you sit back and say, wow, my congressman really fought for me on this issue? I really, like, and I'm not trying to be, a, I'm not trying to be smart or sarcastic. Yeah. You know, generally tell me, because if you like Ben Klein, if he's done something good for you, hey, I would love to know that. Um, he's my, even though he's my opponent, he's still my congressman too. Um, so, you know, I would, I would love to not think he's the most horrible person in the world. But, you know, unfortunately, I have not been proven wrong. Um, he continues to vote against even the, the things that every other, Bob Good over in the 5th District, he even voted for um, banning abusing horses. Ben Klein was the only Virginia representative to vote against ending animal horse cruelty. Why would you vote against horse cruelty? And we in Lexington we have the horse center. That's where he, he before he moved. He lived in the very area that has the horse center, like that brings tourists from all over the place. Yeah. So. You don't think that there's horse lovers in this district. You don't think that, it, and even if, even if everybody, even if every human hated horses, you still do the right thing. Why would you be okay with abusing horses? Like, and that's the thing, like Ben Klein can't even get behind stopping the abuse of animals. Like how, how sick is that? So of course he's not going to care about giving you health care. Of course he's not going to care about ending gun violence he doesn't even care about ending the ho abusing horses and that's something easy to do that's literally so easy to do it's not even political bob good voted for it if bob he, good voted for it that's a that's an indictment right there right <laughs> you know yeah because bob good is the opposite he he makes noise uh an uncomfortable noise over in the fifth district but uh you know, this it's just a reminder that elections do mean something. Um, yeah. We found this out the hard way in, in Virginia in 2021. Um, you know, when I ran the numbers, uh, the only reason Republicans won is they got a lot more of their voters out than Democrats. Uh, about 800,000 people who voted for Joe Biden in 2020 in Virginia didn't go vote for governor uh, yeah. in, for their Democratic well, candidate and, governor. Well, and, you know, I know you probably picked up on this. I mean, Youngkin was in Augusta County. Every other week, yeah. McAuliffe never came here, never, not yeah. once. Yeah. So, you know, it, and going back to that radio conservative radio show that I did last week, when I got on the call, the the radio uh, announcer he said, "You're the only Democrat that's ever agreed to come on my show," and I said, "You know, that's really really disappointing because I don't care who you are. If you're running for office, you have to talk to everybody. What?" Who do you think you are that you can ignore anybody? And it bothers me even more that the Democrats do that because if Republicans wouldn't talk to you or someone else, we would be like, why are they not talking to the media? What do they have to hide? And so, of course, and this gentleman, he might be a conservative uh, radio, he might have a conservative radio show, but he treated me with respect. He was nice. Every, like, we got along fine, you know, and it's, it's so disappointing to think that anybody, Republican or Democrat, thinks that they are better than anybody else, that they can ignore anybody. Um, and, you know, maybe everybody listening to that radio interview, maybe they're all like, oh, Jennifer Lewis, she's a liberal. I don't like her. Never going to vote for her ever. But she showed up, you know, and that's worth it to me every day of the week, because those folks might eventually get sick of Ben Klein. Maybe Ben Klein will ignore them and they'll say, you know. I might not agree with everything Jennifer said, but I heard her on the radio and she didn't sound like a baby killer to me. Maybe she wouldn't be that bad, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's what I'm going for is, you know, that folks are going to be so disappointed in Ben Klein that 
you know, these elections are every two years. Vote for me this, this time around. Give me a chance. And if you don't like me, vote me out in two years. But give me that chance. Mark Warner uh, always runs out here. Tim Kaine followed in his footsteps and always uh, tries hard out here. And they don't win majorities, but they get more votes because they come out here. Barack Obama, uh, the campaign in 2008, I was a Democratic Party chair in Waynesboro in 2008. And boy, what an education that was. The Kerry campaign in 2004 only had 10 staff people for the whole state of Virginia. We had two staff people in Augusta County, um, St. Waynesboro, Augusta County. Um, uh, paid staff people from the Obama campaign. They knew, to, and you have to run everywhere. You can't ignore yeah. anybody. And honestly, right. it frustrates me living out in this part of, of Virginia uh, and looking around at the economics and looking at the, the, the only reason to me this area is is uh, looked at, uh, you know, and the numbers bear it out, but uh, as, as being, you know, so, so strong Republican, it's not because of the fact that People out here benefit from Republican votes and policies. They don't. We don't. People out here don't benefit from big business getting the right. tax breaks right. and from deregulation. We don't benefit from any of that stuff. We don't right. benefit from not having access to universal health care. We don't benefit from uh, you know the, the lack of gun control laws, common sense gun control laws. Uh, we don't benefit from p- public education not being funded well. The only reason these people are Republicans is what you said earlier, uh, uh, Jennifer. It's it's that they feel like. Democrats look down on them yep. and and that we don't want to come talk to them. And then we right. reinforce that when we don't go talk to right. them, which, um, which kills me because and, and I and I hate I talk about this a lot. I get judged for the way I look all the time. I don't dress good enough. My hair is not good enough. My makeup's not, my makeup. Everyone always has something to say about my makeup. Ben Klein literally wears the same outfit every day. But when he goes on these farm tours, he wears khaki pants and loafers. And that really bothers me. I was born and raised on a dairy farm. Why are you wearing loafers on a farm? You're going to get, you're going to step in cow poop. How do you not have boots? And so it kills me that no one ever brings up the fact that Ben Klein shows up at these farm tours in a, you know, in a button up shirt and khakis and loafers. Yet I get criticized for not wearing lipstick enough. You know, it's just... I the double you, standards are just ridiculous. Um, I, mean, I, I love Ben again. He's a nice enough person, but I imagine him sitting, he probably goes to bed in loafers and, and khakis. It just, but that's not authentic. You know, that's not the way, you know, and, and, and yeah, you're right. It's if, if you're worried about people looking down at you, that's looking down at you. Right. Showing up at a farm dress like you're going to the country club. Exactly. <laughs> and And that's, you know, I try to think of those things like, you know, if, if Ben Klein showed up, my, up at my dad's farm dressed like that, and I, and I do have to say my dad voted for Trump, which blows my mind, but, you know, my dad would make, I mean, he might not make fun of him to his face, but after he left, he'd be like, oh my God, can you believe what he showed up on the farm dressed, dressed where? Like, you know, I would show up dressed, if I'm going on a farm, I'm showing up dressed to hop on the the hay wagon and help unload hay like you don't show up at a farm not ready to work because there's always work to be done on the farm so I mean the first time I took my husband home uh we went to up to the barn my dad and grandpa were unloading hay my my husband literally jumped right on the back of the wagon and started unloading hay and my grandpa's like we're he's good like (laughs) welcome to the family like that's what you do when you show up on a farm you show up ready to help what needs to be done because there's always something to be done on the farm so this guy shows up like no he's not ready to help you he's not gonna help birth your calf out in the field but guess what i will (laughs) i I would i would bet on you in that contest uh, no doubt about that Uh (laughs) so i have the best story so uh i don't remember how old i was middle school and a cow had given birth out in the field so my dad's like we got to go get the cow and the baby. And so my dad knows he's setting me up. Um, so he's like, I'll take the mom cow. You take the baby cow. So he gives me this rope and I put the rope on the baby's neck. And this cat, this cat was just born. Like it's hours old. And my dad's like, don't let go of it. We're in a fenced in yard. So we really, I should have thought this through, but I held on to that calf and that calf took off running dragged me through the field i'm covered in cow poop from head to toe and of course my dad's laughing like 
yeah, the mom cow is domesticated. So she's walking very calmly back to the barn with my dad. This calf is a newborn. She has no idea what's going on. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. So yeah, That's that was my uh, getting a calf out of the field story. That's reality right there. Thanks, yeah. Dad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one I, i've kept you over time but i wanted to throw out one oh, more fine. thing um the um what what do we do republicans do so well when when they have power or even when they don't have power they don't even have they don't have a single they don't have the presidency they don't have either congress they do have the supreme court but when even when they're not in power they keep things from being done and when they have yep. power they do things Democrats don't. What do we what do we do? What do you do when you get to Congress to make sure we do things? So stop being so nice. We play by the rules. They don't. Um, and we are we are always trying to be like, please, uh, please be my friend. I just want to be your friend. Be my friend. Be my friend. Be my friend. No, the, the, we are we are way past all of that. Um, and I'm so tired of everyone saying we got to become more moderate to get more people from the right to become. No, that is that doesn't work. And when you go more moderate, you lose people on the left who won't, won't show up. Yeah. Um, and I think our primary in 2018 showed that, you know, we had a primary in 2018. There was four of us running. I was the only progressive, loud Democrat. And I won a four way race with almost 50 percent of the vote. So the sixth district wants a loud, progressive person. And that's, that's who I will be if I get elected to DC. I am not, I will never go more moderate to get more Republicans to come on board. We're going full steam ahead with a progressive agenda. And if they can't get on board, then they're gonna have to come to the table to, with compromises because I'm sick of us always having to be the, the bigger person. What has being the bigger person got us? 50 years of, of you know, lack of health care, 50 years of lack of gun control, all, you know, we don't have a living wage. We've been fighting for $15 an hour for so long that that's not even accurate anymore. You know, a $15 an hour wage wouldn't even keep you alive in, in Waynesboro. Right. Which is a cheap um, place to live for those who don't live around here. That's a, that's right. a really inexpensive place to live. Right. Um, so, you know, we've, we've really got to, we've got to choose our leaders, um, that have, and I think that's why Trump, you know, did so well is because he had the balls and the nerve and the guts or whatever you want to say to, to say what he wanted to say um, and go ahead with those actions with all those executive orders, all of that stuff. Um, you know, that's, that's not the way to do government. That's not democracy. Um, but I think, you know, we've got to, if they're not going to play by the rules then we've got to play by their rules too. Um, and really just, you know, be loud and strong. And, you know, one of the things that I'm really pushing is, um, you know, the, the abortion topic before the, the mass shooting um, topic took over, we were really, you know, we were focused on this overturning Roe versus Wade. Um, and to stop saying pro-choice and to just say abortion rights, um, because we need to take away that stigma of, of abortion. Everybody says like, we've got it. We, you can't say the word abortion. That's going to upset people. Um, and that, again, just stigmatizes all the women who have had to make that choice for whatever reason. And guess what? It's none of our business. Um, so, you know, just kind of re reclaiming our narrative um, and not allowing them to say that they're pro-life because they're not. So I'm going to fight that top, uh, title um, all I can um, this election because it's not fair that they get to say that they're pro-life. Well, what's the opposite of pro-life? That's not me. Um and they're definitely not pro-life. You know, they, they, if you allow kids to be murdered at school when they're six years old, that's not pro-life. Um, you know, voting against Medicare for all, that's not pro-life. Like all of those things. So, um, you know, I'm going to be, you know, reclaiming all these words that they've been co-opting and using against us. Um, and I think all of us Democrats need to do that and say, you know, I support abortion rights, not I'm pro-choice. I support abortion rights. I support your right to have an abortion if you want one. Yeah, and and universal health care. We don't need to be scared of Medicare for all universal health care. We 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 gave that away uh, in 2009, 2010. We've we've given we gave away the Supreme Court, which now leads yep. us in the direction of where we are in Roe v. Wade and, and gun control and everything else. And 
yeah, we, we've got a, we've got, the, the stakes are too high. Um, yeah. our, kids, our, our kids are, are behind uh, education wise. Our health system is an embarrassment for a country with our wealth. Um, we don't do, we, we, it's not a country with, with basic civil rights for right. anyone who's not, I'm a white male. Hey, it's right. a great world for me. Yep. But if you're not a white male, um, you're not equal. And we don't it's, do we, so many things. You know, other countries have put a warning on traveling to America yeah. because you might get shot at the grocery store or the movie theater. So think, you know, you want to say America's number one, we're the best. Well, when other countries are warning their tourists about coming to our country, I feel like that's a pretty big red flag. Um, you know, that people have to hesitate about wanting to come and visit our beautiful country because, oh my God, I could be, you know, just down, uh, you know, going to a concert in Las Vegas and get shot up and die. I don't want to die in America, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And so again, it's just, it's a lack of, um, a lack of being true to themselves. It's a lack of um, uh, caring, empathy. I don't know. Um, but I really just, I don't know what more I can do to beg people to care, to beg people to show up and vote. Um, what more to do? Um, and how much more clear to make how serious this is, you know, and how easily we could have a different life. Well, let's continue these conversations as the summer turns to fall. We got to just keep reminding people. So I'll, I'll do my part. I, you know, I'm, and I admire you for going out and and taking every invitation you can, speaking with conservative uh, radio show hosts, everybody else, and and you're going to be going up and down 81 a lot this uh, this this summer and fall. And I'll probably we'll, take 11 as most as, as much as I can. Let's oh be well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I, I'm not the only person who does that then because <laughs> oh, I never get on 81 like. If I got to run to Harrisonburg, I take 11. Oh, oh yeah. I'm no doubt. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's, and that's, a, that's another federal issue we could dive into sometime down the road too, uh, down the road, literally, you know, I, I have to go to Lexington a lot in the spring. I do, I do baseball game broadcast. One of my fun side gigs I do, and I never take 81. It's, it's way overcrowded and, mm -hmm. um, another failure of our local leadership. To, well, to and, and it kills me because and all of the traveling on 81, I very rarely see a police officer at all. Um, the traffic is so dangerous. It is, you are traveling, like the speed limit is, is 70, but it's a hundred. Um, right. And the tractor trailers are so dangerous. So it's not even just 81 being so just congested and, and crappy, but the, the condition of the drivers is, is very concerning. The amount of times I've been on 81, and almost rear-ended by someone looking at their cell phone. Um, you know, it's, I think we definitely need to step up, um, you know, safety patrols um, on our highways because people continue to die on 81. And, and it was just recently that it was shut down for a couple of hours. That impacts people being able to get to work, get their kids home from school, um, causes all sorts of anxiety and, and stress for everybody when, when these things happen. So, um, you know, we've, we've got to figure out something and, you know, tra uh, upgrading our trains, getting a lot of the freight and, you know, the tractor trailers off of the highway, put them on, on trains, um, is something I really support. Um, cause you know, ex you said you'd get, go down to Lexington a lot where they've expanded to three lanes is not helpful. If anything, it makes it more dangerous because if you're in the middle lane, and then you want to like pass someone, you don't know if someone's passing on the left and the right, and then you both merge back at the same time. Yeah, um, yeah. And it just ends up being a bottleneck um, at the end of the three lanes. So I think, you know, expanding the, the off and on ramps are, are extremely important, especially on those um, inclines that the tractor trailers really have trouble getting up um, and fixing, you know, the Rafine area where the, the uh, truck stop is, is really congested. I think we can, we, there's a lot of, um, a lot of wiggle room in that area of making that a little bit more smoother too. Um, but again, all of these problems that we've talked about are, are problems that we've known about for years and decades. So why do we keep electing the same people? I, I just don't get it. Just don't get it. The same people who've done nothing about them. Right. Yeah. Um, watch them get worse. Yeah. Right. 
Well, yeah, we've, we'll, we'll, Jennifer, this has been enlightening and uh, very, very educational. I really appreciate your time on this and we'll have you back on again soon.